Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I am your host, Eric Fisher. This is the podcast where we talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, we're talking with Tony Stubblebine of Lyft App. Tony is a self-described startup nerd, human potential nerd, and he's also the CEO and co-founder of Lyft App. And if you've not checked out Lyft App, it is a motivational, accountability, goal setting and keeping and giving each other props type of an app. It's also on the web. And actually, they recently just came out with an update. Tony and I talk about what Lyft App is, what's the key and secret to setting and making goals in a community, and a number of other really cool kind of productivity ideas I wasn't even aware of yet. So Tony is definitely somebody I am now following on Twitter. You can follow him at Tony Stubblebine on Twitter. But first, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Audiobooks.com. Audiobooks.com has over 40,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers, new releases, and classic favorites. You can listen anywhere from downloading the Audiobooks.com app to your Apple or Android device for offline listening, or you can stream them instantly. You can also stream them on Audiobooks.com using your computer or tablet. When you become a member, you get one audiobook per month plus 33% off each additional title you listen to, and you can preview as many books as you like even before signing up. Sign up today at audiobooks.com slash to do, that's T-O-D-O, and get your first audiobook free. So again, go to audiobooks.com slash to do to sign up and get your first audiobook free. This week, my guest is Tony Stubblebine of Lyft App. Tony, welcome to the show. Eric, thank you. Lyft. Okay. I know that a lot of people out there have maybe heard about the app before. Can you give us quickly in a nutshell, and then we'll dive deeper, what is Lyft App? So Lyft App is a self-improvement app that's meant to work for any goal. And right now we're supporting more than 100,000 different goals, ranging from very simple habits to very large productivity goals, to very large fitness goals, to very large um, health and dietary goals. And the way it works is that you uh, choose however many goals you want to tackle at a time. And then we provide you daily coaching, daily prompting, and uh, a way to track your progress in each of those goals. And so the idea is to take is to basically package up the kind of coaching you would get in person and then just make it available in your phone so that it's whenever you get the urge to tackle some aspect of your life, you know, you know you have a tool with you and that tool is lift up. There's so many different places that we can go with this. Right. I know that it's it, it originally started as an iOS app specifically iphone although you can blow it up on an ipad screen i guess it's not universal is it no it, it you know it's funny it, it actually the iphone version looks a lot better on the ipad now that ios 7 is oh yeah out. yeah whole, totally agree um but it, it it is just it's iphone android and web right now okay and 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 the, what's great is you added the web. So so if you don't have an iPhone and you and you want to do Android, either it's basically it's cross platform, web yeah. and, and mobile platform, which is a, a great addition. But it started mobile based, right? Well, I mean, are we gonna, are we going to talk about failure a little bit today? Oh, totally. Let's talk about right. that. Right. So here, my experience of entrepreneurship, this is the second company I've started and the fourth startup that I've worked for, is that there's just this incredible amount of trial and error. So from the public's perspective, it started for the iPhone. But from my perspective, it started as a web project that I had built just for myself. And then it actually went through three or four major revisions on the web before we decided it really wasn't going to work unless it was on your phone. You know, once we made that decision, then we were most comfortable developing for the iPhone. The iPhone, if you ignore the um, number of uh, installation, the number of phones in the world, just usage of apps on the iPhone is the, you know, basically the biggest market. So that's what we focused on. We were a small team and we wanted to get a proof of concept out there. And uh, that's how we ended up on the, on the iPhone. But from my perspective, having been part of every, uh, every failed experiment, I, would, you know, I don't feel like we started on the iPhone. 
Okay. Let's talk a little bit about what it is and what it does. I mean, the word lift in and of itself is this, yeah. you know, the, and the arrow. I, I sense you're going for some kind of a thematic thing there. What What is that? And then how exactly does the Lift app work? Well, when I started it, I was really obsessed with the idea of bringing in a lot of positive reinforcement into my life because I thought, all right, I have all of these goals. I'm only making progress on some of them. But if I could have the, like an outside entity pushing me forward on all of all of these other goals, then you know I I could become the person that you know I wish I was. And it's not like I was struggling, but I definitely always had something more that I wanted to achieve. And so we're really focused on on concepts that come out of positive psychology. It's, it's not it's not the psychology of sickness. It's the psychology and research of people who are successful. Let me throw out a concept to you and. Uh, see if it makes sense to you. Sure. The, the, we've really been interested lately in a concept we're calling your cognitive budget. So there had been research recently um, that's starting to make its way into the public space around decision fatigue, where every decision, big or small, kind of wears down your ability to make decisions in the day to the point where at the end of the day, you're just you're totally beat and you go with whatever the default easy path is. And so it's actually an interesting explanation for why people don't do things that they know are good for them. And so when we look at it in terms of cognitive budget, what that says is there's a certain number of decisions you're going to be able to make each day. And if you want to be more successful, it answers this question of, how can you tackle it? Well, actually, you can tackle it by reducing any drain on your cognitive budget. And like, you know, so people ask me a lot, like, how, what, what are the habits of a successful leader? Or what are the habits of a successful entrepreneur? And actually, when you look, about, look at the brain science, any habit contributes to better performance as an entrepreneur or as a leader or, you know, any aspect of your life because it takes away one of these cognitive drains. Does that, does that make any sense? Oh, yeah. I, to- I totally get it. Let's say you've got $1,000 in the bank and that's how much you have to spend towards decisions for the day. Even if you make up a, a lot of small dollar type decisions throughout the day, you still only have that certain ceiling you're going to hit. And if you hit it sooner in the day or later in the day, like you're, you, quote unquote, you're spent. Exactly. And I have a great anecdote for it, which a lot of people should know. It is if you've ever heard when Steve Jobs was alive – towards the he just he kind of decided on a work uniform which is yeah right it's that black turtleneck every day he would wear a black turtleneck to work so if you think about his life in terms of cognitive load every day he'd wake up and he'd put on the black turtleneck that was sitting on the po- at the top of the pile of black turtlenecks whereas when i woke up today i checked the weather I, I looked at my calendar to see who i was meeting today and then i i had to make a decision uh, about which of like maybe 50 different shirts I could wear today, right? And so actually the whole, just the act of me getting dressed probably took 10 or 15 decisions. And so if you imagine Steve Jobs leaving the house for work and me leaving the house for work, he was already 15 decisions ahead of me or he'd save 15 extra decisions that he could use in his job, which is was really his passion. And I had wasted 15 because I don't have, I don't have as strong as a, of a routine around my morning habits. Yeah, exactly. So then how does that tie into our developing or having the right habits? It, it kind of explains why there are 100,000 different things that people tackle yeah. and lift, right? That if you can just carve out one piece of your life and turn that into a routine, get really good at that, make that a permanent part of your life, is not only do you get the benefit of whatever your goal was, which was you know, to to floss or to set priorities every morning or or to run three times a week or to make it to the gym or to, you know, eat low carb lunches, right? Like all of those, you know, by themselves have benefits, but then there's always the secondary benefit of you've taken a decision that you used to have to make every day and you've freed that decision up to spend somewhere else. By working on improving yourself, you you get to double dip. You know, like every improvement gets two benefits. And I think that's really this, you know, kind of exciting realization about how the brain works. So it's almost like you're 
training yourself to convert these actions into a mental muscle memory. And then you don't have to do that decision anymore because it's a habit. Right. And it's actually habits are triggered in a different part of the brain. And that's separate from the, the part that's kind of affected by this decision fatigue uh, phenomenon. Okay. Interesting. But, you know, even beyond that, right, that I don't, I don't know what your take on some of the, this other pop science around self-improvement. Like, have you ever heard the 10,000 hour rule? Yes, I have. Right. This is Malcolm Gladwell. Well, mm-hmm. popularized it. And it, it, it's a concept that always kind of drives me nuts because I'm actually more of an immediate gratification guy. <laughs> so, you know, it's like when I hear 10,000 hours, what I hear is, you know, I won't get the benefits until I've put in five or 10 years of work. But the reality is you actually start to get benefits at, you know, in the first, you know, couple of minutes to the first couple of hours. And that, that when Malcolm Gladwell was talking about the 10,000 hour rule, what he was really saying is that's when you peak. When you look around, right, like you get all these wins all the way up until your peak, right? And we should we should be excited for and taking advantage of those things as well. And so, you know, when when we talk about creating a habit, it's like, yeah, once the habit is created, it's all locked in and lives in a different part of your brain. That's the peak of the benefit that you're going to get for working on a habit. But just on like day one, like let's say your goal is to go to the gym. Uh, the first time you go to a gym, you will have uh, found a gym, joined a gym. You'll have a gym membership. And so any time you want to go to a gym again, it's going to be a lot easier than uh, than it had been before. And there, there, that's a really common case where you get these benefits in the beginning because you figure out all of the details. And so all of those details also used to represent decisions that would trip you up. And once you can figure those out, you do get you get benefits right away. Yeah, you're wearing uh, you're wearing the groove there, so it's easier. Yeah, I like that. It's a good concept. So uplifting and positive reinforcement is what lift is all about. You said again. You said it a couple of times. How many uh, different things are people working on? Hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. Geez, of those hundred thousand things, I'm sure not all of them are positive things that they're trying to do. They're also mm-hmm. trying to positively reinforce stopping doing certain things probably right yeah that's true there's a i mean there's a no smoking there's a no alcohol there's i'm personally on a no sweets one right now Uh um do do you do you have any goals along those lines i've i've got uh, yeah i've got walking ten thousand steps a day yeah, that's a positive one. Yeah, that's a positive one. I don't have any negative ones in there, actually. Okay. I'm going for all positives. to, to yeah. And I guess my, my approach is add in the positives and it weeds out the negatives almost by byproduct of it. That's exactly where I was going to go. The, the term that most behavior designers would use is they, they call it a replacement habit. So rather than trying to break a habit, you try and find a new habit that you can form and reinforce that almost prevents the old habit. So, for example, my no sweets goal has a bunch of small replacement habits, one of which if I go out to dinner, I, my, I'm trying to create the habit of when the dessert menu shows up, I'm looking for the cheese plate or the tea, right? And so now, my, you know, like I used to think, okay, I have an appetizer, I have an entree, and then I have dessert. Now I think I have an appetizer, I have an entree, then I have tea. And so my habit is ordering tea rather than, you know, trying not to order, you know, cake. Yeah, so, it, just putting it in there. I mean, it, it basically, if, if, if the pegs already fit in there of the good habit, there's no room for the yeah. bad habit. Right. That's generally how most people try to tackle breaking a habit or tackle a bad habit. Now, what's your thoughts on the whole how many days does it take? Because I've heard it varying degrees how many days it takes to like set a habit in play, you know? Um, I've heard 21. I've heard like 31. I've heard 35 even for some reason. So the, there's basically two answers. The 21 is the, the pop culture answer. It's the most commonly given. It actually has uh, only one basis in science, which is a little bit gruesome. It was a, a doctor who was researching amputees and how long it took them to to deal with losing a limb. You know, like at 21 days, they stopped feeling like that limb should be there. But something along those lines. Okay. So like, kind of like 
really have has nothing to do with what we're talking about in terms of making a habit, but that's the only study that ever came back at 21 days, and I don't even think it was that rigorous of a study. The scientific definition of a habit is actually a, involves a really strong routine where like it, you don't think about it in your conscious mind hardly at all. Like I think at the end of the night for most of us when we go to the bathroom and we stand in, uh, in front of the mirror, it doesn't take a lot of thought to for our hand to reach for the toothpaste and reach for the toothbrush. And that's a habit. And so often those things can take 60, 100, a couple hundred repetitions before it really starts to look in the scientific definition of habitual. But there's this whole gradation in there where every time you do a repetition, it becomes easier and easier for you. Okay. And and this kind of ties into the – I'm sure you've probably heard of this, the whole Seinfeld – productivity hack where you talk yeah, about yeah. breaking the chain and marking the days on the calendar and well, this is where we talk about posi- the positive psychology right i i think of that as a very momentum based uh, approach cuz you know and and i like to compare that to people who are over optimizers cuz when you when you look at his the seinfeld calendar it all his his rule is just write one joke at least one joke per day he doesn't say, well, you know, try to write 10, try and set a personal record. He doesn't measure how many of those jokes end up making it into an act because he just realized, you know, 80, 90 percent of his productivity come taking one step and getting some momentum going. And I bet you, you know, on your average day, he's actually putting in you know, a really solid amount of work. And it's not just like he writes a joke and then and then, you know, goes for a bike ride. Right. I have a little bit more detail on someone else who's really productive, who has a similar method. And it's Stephen King, who I think his thing was like, yeah. is it like 2,000 words a day? Something along it's 2,000 words a day. I just heard this from somewhere. I can't remember where it was, but he writes 2,000 words a day. Right. But what I love about the rest of that story is that he says, you know, I'm almost always done by 4 or 5 p.m. Sometimes I finish as early as 1 p.m. So here we have... Like, we can all see he's one of the most prolific writers of this current era. Like, he puts out more books than almost anyone that anyone else writing, you know, since Isaac Asimov. But he's always done before 5 p.m. So here I am. I work in a a startup. I live in this kind of startup uh, ecosystem out here in San Francisco where people are thinking, you know, they better work till 10 p.m. till 12 to 2 a.m., because hoping that that's going to make them more productive. And Stephen King is just showing, no, actually, consistency is what makes you productive. Yeah, it, it's that consistency. It's that, uh, oh, what's the phrase where it's uh, uh, death by a million cuts. It's that constant or consistent forward momentum mm-hmm. on a single goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was just curious, you know, what, are, what do you think the challenge is that your community is, is facing when it comes to productivity? I think part of it is is trying to – I think a lot of them, they, they may have an idea of where they want to be, but become successful is not a thing in Lyft where you can just push that every single day. You know what I mean? I know. The, the breaking, it, the, it's the, the breaking it down into actual – if life is a project, breaking it down into action steps. I, I, I usually tell people it, there's good news and there's bad news, right? We've researched a huge number of very successful people. And the, the good news is that they all got where they, they are through hard work and practice. Uh, and then that's also the bad news, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. You're not, going, you're not going to get there overnight. So you could get there, but you're going to have to get off the couch. Yeah. So that then if they've accepted that and they know – and they look at it and say, no, it's good news. I know that it's in my hands and I can do it. You know, It's up to them to decide what is it that I want to do and how do I break that down into yeah. the steps and start consistently forming those habits that get me there. So this is why I love the cognitive budget formulation because it, it helps you eliminate that, that kind of – paralysis by analysis situation where you're like, well, I don't know exactly what the next thing I should do is. Because really, the people that we're talking about, you, me, probably most of your listeners, we're not part-time at what we do. We're full-time. And that means that we're overworked. We're working ourselves to the limit. 
And so anytime we can take away you know, some complication in our life, anyway, anytime we can simplify a part of our life, we're actually making ourselves more effective in, that, in, our, in our core goal. And so to me, this is why I like the word momentum is when we look at the research, when we look at other people, like really that's a terrible place to be because almost anything you do to, to work on your, towards your goals ends up growing into a, a bigger change. If that makes sense, yeah, yeah, and I've heard th- I've heard that from uh, one or two other guests in in the past. They've said, you know, it's that uh, Crystal Payne, for example, she she said uh, that discipline begets discipline. So right. if you if you become disciplined as working on one thing, even the things you weren't working on as goals start to become more disciplined just by the byproduct. Right. We use the phrase sometimes of the the habit of making habits. That's the real nice. power of Lyft. You know, you've you find yourself making one habit and then you realize, oh, you know, you've got a tool in your toolbox that you can start applying all over the place. So do you think for maybe somebody that feels stuck and they don't know what to work on, obviously we all have something even as small as drink enough water for the day that we just yeah. start with that and then we suddenly it, – it, it starts to loosen the cobwebs or the – gets the gears moving in our brain as to what else we could be working on. It's funny. That is one of the most popular – uh, goals and left yeah. is just to drink more water uh, with tens of thousands of people working on it. And it actually, it has a really high correlation with success in other areas. So we did, um, we looked at our data recently trying to figure out you know, what is the right number of goals for a person to work on. And you know, before we looked at the data, we guessed that the number would be pretty low because you want to have all of your focus applied to to just those few goals. And what we actually found is that success in Lyft peaked when people were tackling eight things. And, and then when we dove into it, the best explanation we could get was that at around that number, everyone had at least one thing that they were consistently making progress in. And then that, that gave them momentum, which they then over time would transfer into all of the other goals. So, you know, according to our data, Drink more water is actually a great place to start for almost any ambition. Huh. That's interesting. The, so the eight tasks or or yeah. habits, they is that kind of like a tipping point where – or is that just – that's the amount that on average somebody that was actually consistently doing one of them. But what it really looked like was by the time you got to eight, people had included – at least one relatively easy one. So, and you so could have, it was kind of a snowball effect. Yeah, right. It like, yeah. So, I mean, if you think about someone's ambitions, like they might come to Lyft and say, I might run a marathon and I might learn to meditate and I might set priorities. I might like create the habit of setting priorities every morning. And then uh, what else should I do? Oh, yeah, I might try and drink more water, right? And it's like that was the fourth thing that they chose. But once they got there, when the next day came around, they're like, oh, I was too busy this morning to meditate and I didn't, it was too cold to run, uh, but at least I'll get my glass of water in. And so it's like the number actually had to do with at what point people would get to these smaller trivial goals because we're all like we're all almost too ambitious for our own good. So the first things that we sign up for are always like the hardest. Yeah. So it's always the, you know, all right, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to, the vague goals like lose weight and things like that, that don't, that don't actually have a concrete kind of a way to track, you know? Right. I mean, thankfully, thankfully for us, like Lyft has done a good job of of breaking those goals, lose weight in particular into components. So people are either tracking something like, you know, eat a slow carb diet today or eat vegetarian today or eat at least one vegetable yeah actually drink more water is technically in that in that in that category too so for me i gave up sweets that's my big dietary one that's good it turns out all my bad habits are based around all my bad eating habits are based around uh, a sugar addiction and you know if you work in an office right people are always bringing in donuts i know and startups here are the worst for some reason, they think it, it's good for the company to provide free candy to the employees, and I mean, I, I just think that's crazy. Yeah, it's it's they bring in free uh, sugar covered sugar, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what about the the social component? How does that play into this? 
So, I mean, in a lot of ways, Lyft is a translation of things that work in the real world. So in the real world, a lot of times when you're training someone or when you're coaching someone, you'll actually pair a professional coach with essentially amateur coaching. So the professional has all of the research, they have the theory, and they're providing the framework and the structure. So if you're tackling some of the bigger goals in Lyft, there's actually coaches have written step-by-step instructions, today do this, today, you know, tomorrow do this next thing. But then where the amateur coaching comes in, which is essentially peer-to-peer coaching, is that no matter what the coach tells you to do, there's going to be something that you struggle with that the coach didn't you know, didn't account for beforehand. And so, I mean, here's actually a really easy example to test how strong Lyft was. My co-founder and I, who are both like huge meat eaters normally, decided we were going to go vegan for four months. And yeah, actually, the intellectually understanding what it means to go vegan is actually pretty simple. You like eat a lot of vegetables, don't, don't eat meat, don't eat cheese, don't eat eggs, right? But to put it into practice, we were struggling with questions like where where do vegans eat lunch in this neighborhood right and the way we got those answers was not by going to you know a vegan cookbook author who lives on the other side of the country we went to the vegans who were using lyft who were in san francisco and they said you know eat at this uh place herbivore eat at this place loving hut and you know like and they knew or if you go to this taqueria you know get this you know they'll make it without the cheese right like they had all of those little details sorted out and that's what really makes a complete experience is when you can have some expert with the theory and then a community of their kind of cheering you on and giving you uh, tips and answering those little questions that that trip all of us up yeah and that plays into the, the whole props thing was when you have friends on the app they can give you props and you get this little – you get either – depending upon what granularity of, of settings you've set, you either get emails or you get dings on your phone or – and it's that positive reinforcement, not just from you yourself internally and seeing your consistency with your, your you know checking in on your goals, but from others cheering you on. Yeah. And I love that. ends that. up having a – yeah. I, it is – it does have a, a really positive effect on people because it – it provides a sense of a, uh, positive reinforcement. Actually, provides a little bit of accountability. You know that some of your friends are, are watching you, and even um, gamification. You can yes, you can some, compete with your friends. Yep. You know, because it's social, people kind of bring their own frameworks to it. So some people are very competitive, and they'll look at that as a competitive situation. Then other people come to it and think it's a really collaborative situation. And, you know, I run into a lot of people who are impressed with the, the generosity of the Lyft community. And then I run into a different set of people who are just really inspired and want to do, you know, want to impress uh, the Lyft community. And it is kind of it, they're seeing different things in the exact same set of features. How does the the new uh plans fit into this uh the future of of lyft i know those that's a new feature how does that work so yeah so like a lot of startups now we test features pretty heavily before rolling them out completely and what we had been testing is the test is called plans which are essentially step-by-step instructions from a coach and what we learned as we did that actually is that it opened up a whole nother set of goals beyond just habits, which is what most of the early goals were, and also had a more than 40% boost to people's success rates, which is huge. I, I mean, I can't think of anything else we've done that, that that's that successful. But actually, by the time this podcast releases, probably we will have taken that test and merged it into the whole app. So it won't look as much like a standalone thing. There'll just be one concept, goals, which can encompass things you're training for, things you're learning, um, things that you're being coached in, and habits that you're, you're, you're working on. And all of them will have kind of the, the same sort of coaching and prompting as, okay. uh, as part of it. I know it's always tricky for me when I like because we change so rapidly. Like we we try to move really quickly, and it's always tricky to talk about something that's happening happened recently and lift, knowing that you know whatever I say today is going to be different uh, two weeks from now. Well, and so speaking of the future, where do you see lift? What what problems or 
What uh, what's the future of Lyft? Where are you headed in terms of what's got your headspace in terms of this maximizing your potential? Yeah, you know, for us, what we're really thinking about is what is the future of quantified self. So our mantra for next year is work on bigger problems. And the first one we're tackling, we're launching today actually the uh, um, initiative we're calling it the Quantified Diet Project, and the idea is for the first time ever take comprehensive measurements of most popular diets. And we're working with UC Berkeley on this. And what I, when I say it's, it, it kind of is the future of quantified self, I mean, there's been a lot of people who've been measuring their own behavior, but we have this incredible database of measurements and we can get more from surveys. And, and we've even done diet experiments in the past where for the first time ever, like we're going to be able to tell you what diets are most effective for weight loss, what diets are easiest, what are, uh, for each diet, what are the keys to being successful? What are, you know, the keys being, what are the tips? Which ones are the most pleasurable? Which ones have the longest long-term effects? And, you know, frankly, that stuff has never been done for almost anything in the self-improvement industry. So, I mean, if you think of self-improvement very broadly, to include education, productivity, self-help, diet, fitness. Like, there's just a lot of advice that's given out that's never been validated. And this is what I, my hope for this quantified self world of where there's a lot more tracking, a lot more data, is that we can bring a level of trust to this industry that's never existed before. Man, that's that is amazing. I, I How's love that for 2014. That, that is, yeah. yeah, definitely. Let's go. That's awesome. So like, for us, I'm all about decision just, making based yeah. on data, you know? On data, right. Yeah. So diet is just one thing you know, that we've carved out, but you know, we'd love to do something productivity related. I'm curious. For, all right, this is a really important question. What do you think the big disagreements are in the greater productivity world? There's this whole backlash. One, one way is – uh, you have to be an early riser. The other is, is, no, I'm a night owl. And then, you know, which one's right? Yeah, right. That's one of them. I know. I, I'm i someone who the idea of getting up at 5 a.m. really frightens me. It just like, it, just even that that is something that people recommend actually causes me stress. Yeah, that's one. I think that's um, one. I think another would be uh, people who see if I can phrase this the right way. There are people who say that you always you you only have a certain amount of time. So if you say you don't have time, it's because you you're not uh, planning yourself your stuff well or, or something along those lines. And other people are like, well, I'm already using all my time. Like I I'm all, I just don't have any more time to give. And I don't know. That's that's kind of a right. I think, vague thing. But I think there's a, de- a debate between over specifying your life and leaving time for creativity. Right. It's like if you wake up like, you know, if you're if you're running a system and, you know, you've kind of specified all of the things you're going to do for a week and your week is really just about doing tasks. But when, you know, a lot of like a lot of times creative people will be really disorganized, have really messy desks. And, you know, they maybe they've gone too far in the other direction where they're just too sucked into their own creativity. But I think, you know, getting that balance to me is not is not a trivial a trivial thing. And I think, you know, productivity is probably is just like every other aspect of self-improvement is that the advice you get, get is given to you by people pushing, you know, a very narrow system. And so you never, like, I don't think you've ever really been able to see, you know, like GTD versus Pomodoro or do they work well together? Or, you know, and, um, you know, I'd, I'd really like to get it or, um, you know, which of these are hard and which of these are easy? Or in the case of GTD, which actually has a lot of really good aspects to it, if you're not going to adopt the whole thing, which I think a lot of people don't adopt the whole thing, um, what are the you know best bang for your buck parts of it? That's a great question. We should be able to tell you that. And oh. you know, I think Lyft, because we're not... Actually, David Allen of GTD is one of our investors. So, you know, I, I mean, we always we want to be polite to him. <laughs> but for the most part, we're not... It's not our job to be the guru. You know, we're not pushed. You know, we can be pretty agnostic. Uh, we're just curious. You know, we we see all of this advice, and we want to know what's the best advice and how can people 
will do a better job of, of taking that advice. Yeah, I love it. So that, I love it. 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so be a big so, year for us. So people people can find Lyft if they look up Lyft on their uh, respective uh, app store. They can also go to the web version at lyft.do, which is an awesome URL. And where can they Thank find you. you? I am on Twitter at, at Tony Stubblebine, and uh, that is a good place to find me because then uh, you know this is this is the topic that I like to talk about the most. Definitely. Well, Tony, this this has been awesome. I am going to dive in yeah. further on this, and I'm and actually I'm going to find you on Twitter and follow you because I definitely want to continue this <laughs> conversation. Eric, Eric, please do that. I will. Awesome, Th- Tony. Thank you so much. All right, Eric. This was fun. Thanks again to Tony Stubblebine for stopping by the show. Make sure to check him out on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tony Stubblebine. Let him know you appreciated this episode. And let him know you're trying Lyft app, which, again, you can find at lyft.do. That's lyft.do. Let me and Tony know that you've tried it out and join the community of people that are finding great success with the science of building habits. And again, don't forget, this episode is brought to you by audiobooks.com. Go ahead and sign up at audiobooks.com slash to do and get your first audiobook free. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a rating or review in iTunes and pass the show along to your friends. And I will see you next time. Beyond the To-Do List is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, delve into science fiction and philosophy, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.